So I apologize, I had to do a quick change because uh, it gets really hot in here in the summer up with the lights. And I think because of my medicine, I was just getting really, really hot. And I thought it was better for me to take off my robe than it was to pass out on the altar. So hopefully, hopefully you understand. So this morning we continue uh, the third week in our sermon series entitled Lessons from the Toy Chest. We've been using a different childhood toy each week to help us talk about biblical truths and faith lessons. So far we've used Play-Doh to remind us that not only does God form and mold us, but that God can reshape and remold us when we need it. God can shape us as individuals, but just as importantly, God can shape and reshape the community of faith. Last week, we used Mr. Potato Head to remind us that we are all parts of the body of Christ. Every part has a function, and every part needs to be plugged into Christ if it's going to be of use to the body. So this week, we are looking at paint with water books. Did any of you ever use those as a kid? Does anybody remember them except for me? A few, thank you. I, I think they were probably marketed to moms as, look, it's not messy. Just add water, right? Because you didn't have to use all the watercolors that you then had to wipe everything down. I think I would like to buy them in bulk for my house. But they're actually really hard to find now. I can only find them online. So for those of you who don't remember, the paint with water books would come and all of the paint would already be on the book and you would just take water and dab it on and the color would magically appear where it was supposed to be always within the lines so that the picture always looked beautiful. I wasn't able to find much history on these books, so I have no idea when they were first created or why. I do know, I'm sure they were created by a mom who was tired of cleaning up messy paint. Now, I've never been a very talented painter or artist. Uh, as I told you with the Play-Doh, I could never get it to look like what it was supposed to look like in my head. And the same is true with painting. So I loved that all I had to do was add water and this wonderful, beautiful picture would appear that was always perfect. It always seemed a little bit like magic to me. I knew that the picture and paint were already there, but it never changed that sense of awe that I had as the picture was revealed with the more water I put on. I wonder if my childhood sense of awe in seeing this picture revealed was just a little bit, a very mild version of the awe John must have experienced in our scripture passage this morning. All four of the Gospels report Jesus' baptism. It's one of only a handful of events that is reported in every Gospel. And the accounts in each of the Gospels are remarkably similar. Matthew tells us that John was out in the wilderness offering a baptism of repentance. John was trying to convince people that they needed to change the way that they were living, that they needed to turn away from their sin, away from the things God didn't want them to do, and to turn towards a godly way of living. When people were ready to acknowledge their need for forgiveness and were ready to start living in a new way, they would come to John to be baptized. One day, Jesus shows up and asks John to baptize him. Now, initially in the scripture passage, John refuses. After all, John has been proclaiming this whole time that he is not the Messiah, that the Messiah will come after him, and that John isn't even worthy of untying the Messiah's sandals. So John, both, I think, out of a feeling of unworthiness and out of a sense that Jesus doesn't need to repent of any sins, refuses to baptize Jesus. But Jesus, as he does, insists. So John agrees to baptize Jesus, and when he does, this amazing thing happens. The heavens open up, and a dove descends and rests on Jesus. And then this voice says, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Jesus' baptism revealed his identity in really powerful ways. But what's interesting about that is that John already knew Jesus' identity. John already knew that Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah, loved and beloved by God. Jesus' baptism didn't suddenly create a new identity for Jesus. He didn't become a new person after coming out of the water, but rather his true identity was revealed more fully. It's kind of like before Jesus' baptism, those who knew Jesus uh, was the Son of God had a sort of black and white or silent movie grasp of that knowledge. And then at Jesus' baptism, that identity that he has always had is revealed in technicolor high definition. 
The Apostle Paul says that now we see dimly as if looking in a poor quality mirror, but later we shall see face to face. In Jesus' baptism, it's like the veil is temporarily removed and we see clearly face to face exactly who Jesus is. What we see is that Jesus is God's son. Jesus is loved by God, the very one who holds the pleasure of God. While we get a moment of clarity here in Jesus' baptism, the full understanding of that identity grows and deepens throughout Jesus' ministry. As we watch Jesus eat with tax collectors and prostitutes, as we see Jesus heal the leper, give sight to the blind, feed the 5,000, we see just what it means to be a child of God. As we hear Jesus' teachings on turning the other cheek and forgiving more times than we can count and taking up our cross to follow him, we learn what it means to really please God. Jesus had a really strong sense of self, perhaps the strongest the world has ever seen. Jesus knew who he was, he knew whose he was, and he knew why he was here. His baptism confirmed that identity for him, and that same identity continued to unfold and deepen throughout his life, ministry, death, and resurrection. And even though others tried to distract Jesus from his purpose, he refused to stray from it. Jesus came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and to heal our relationship with God and our neighbors, even when the crowds were clamoring for him to be a miracle healer, even when his disciples tried to prevent him from going to the cross, Jesus always stayed true to his identity and his purpose. I think there are times in the life of the church that we treat baptism, whether you were baptized as a child or as an adult, or even confirmation as an end, as the goal to be reached. But for Jesus, we see that it was the beginning. Jesus' baptism didn't culminate his ministry. It wasn't the final climactic moment. His baptism launched his ministry. It was the very beginning. His baptism occurs in scripture before anything in his ministry begins. Before he's taught in the synagogue, healed a blind man, or debated with the Pharisees. Before he's turned water into wine, taught any of the Beatitudes, or called the disciples. His baptism happens before he walks on water, before he calms the storm before he feeds the 5,000. Baptism wasn't the end goal for Jesus. It was the event that marked the beginning of his ministry. These paint with water pictures that use uh, water to reveal what has always been there. The picture was always there, even if it was hard to see, even if you quite couldn't figure out what it was going to become. The same is true of our identity as God's children. In our baptism, God acts to reveal who we have always been, who we were created from the very beginning to be, child of God, beloved, one who pleases God. The waters of our baptism wash away all that makes us see dimly, so if only for a moment we can see clearly face to face who we really are, our true identity in Christ. Just like Jesus, our identity revealed in our baptism is as much about purpose as it is about personhood. Our identity is as much about what God has called us to do as it is about the person God created us to be. Because those two things are interwoven. At each of our baptisms, God acted to publicly claim us as a child of God, as one who is loved, as one who pleases God. Our understanding of that identity is continually evolving as we learn more about God, more about what it means to be a child of God, more about what love looks like, and more about what it means to please God. The more we learn and grow, the more that we see baptism and confirmation as a beginning and not an end. Like Jesus, it launches us into our ministry. Sometimes I think we have a tendency to treat certain events in life like they are the end or the goal to be reached. Like I said, we, we do that about baptism already. We treat it like um, it's the goal instead of the beginning. But we really do that with lots of things. One of the um, times I see that the most is in weddings. I can't tell you how many couples I have spent 
time with that have spent so much time and energy and money focused on that event, on the wedding, but they have no real concept of what was going to happen the next day, let alone 10 years later or over the next 50. For them, the wedding was the end, a goal to be reached, a milestone to be celebrated, instead of being treated like what it really is, the beginning point of a lifetime in which you learn what it really means to be married to someone. The wedding isn't the goal, it's just the event that marks the beginning. The same is true for our baptism. Baptism isn't the goal of a Christian life. It isn't the ultimate point in our Christian walk. It is an event that marks for us the beginning. The beginning of a lifetime of learning what it means to be a disciple of Christ. The beginning of a lifetime of trying to live up to the example that Christ gives us. The beginning of a lifetime of mistakes. The beginning of a lifetime of asking God to perfect and mold us into better than what we currently are. Baptism isn't the day we are marked and suddenly perfect. We've got it all figured out and are done. Baptism is just the beginning. Through our baptism, we recognize that we are all children of God, that we are all beloved, and that we are all called. We all share in the same ministry that Jesus gave his disciples. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them all that I have told you. That is our mission, too. We are part of the priesthood of all believers, part of the body of Christ, all of us ministers and missionaries. Now, for some of you, that probably sounds a little bit scary. Maybe you're afraid you're going to be called like Jonah to go to a faraway place and instead will run from it and end up in the belly of a big fish. And in some ways, it is a little scary because it is a big job that God has given us. But here's the thing. God doesn't call each of us to fulfill this mission in the same way. We're not all baptized and then handed some card with a secret mission and sent out into the world to do it. No, instead, we are all created with our own passions and gifts and skills and are formed into the kind of minister that God needs to fulfill a specific purpose in the world. And that is revealed to us as we live into the vows we made in our baptism. As we live into the proclamation we make to follow Christ, we begin to fulfill our part of the mission to make disciples. In the last couple of months, I have a friend who has had her um, credit card number stolen a number of times. And then the university where she went to school had all of its personnel files hacked, which means that all of her personal data is floating around out there in the hands of who knows who. So she has to have a credit card company monitoring all of her personal information in case someone tries to steal her identity. Now, it's tempting for us to think that identity theft is a new crime, that something came about with the evolution of computers and the internet and, and it suddenly appeared. But the truth is that identity theft has been around for a long time. And perhaps the most pervasive and dangerous form of identity theft is when we let people steal our baptismal identity. When we let ourselves and others convince us that baptism is the end, that it is a ritual to be performed and then to be looked back on with fond memories and that's it. When we forget that baptism is our ordination into the priesthood of all believers, that it is the moment in which our identity is revealed and our purpose proclaimed, we've allowed our identity to be stolen. When we forget that our baptism is not just a means of grace for us, but for the whole world, we've allowed our identity to be stolen. Your baptism and you living out that identity as God's child, beloved and pleasing to God, is one of the ways that God intends to convey love and grace, hope and forgiveness to the rest of the world. I really love Disney movies, and one of our favorite family Disney movies is Lion King. Now, part of that is because my husband can sing the opening song like the best I've ever heard it. We sometimes make him call and do it on people's phones so it can become their ringtones. So you can, I won't make him do it now, but you can ask him after church and maybe he'll do it in the hallway. Uh, he, he did it at, a, um, he did it at a, a church talent fair once at one of the churches we were at and he redlined the microphone. They had to like turn it off. We thought it was gonna explode. It was really crazy. 
But I love it for another reason, too. So if you remember the movie, it opens with Simba, the baby lion, being presented at his baptism or naming to the whole animal kingdom, right? Uh, they lift him up on that big giant rock and present him. He is presented as the heir apparent, the one who is child of the king, the one who will inherit the kingdom, but also the one who will be responsible for helping to shape the future of that kingdom. Now, when Simba gets older, Scar, his uncle, convinces Simba that he is unworthy to be king. So Simba runs off with the warthog Pumbaa and Timon. And years later, Simba encounters Rafiki, the, priest who, uh, the monkey who kind of represents a priest in the movie, who was the one that um, baptized and presented Simba. Rafiki literally hits Simba over the head with the coconut stick and shows Simba his reflection in the water and says to him, does anybody know what he says? Nobody can quote The Lion King, really? Somebody, you know it, Ruby, don't you? Uh, he says, remember, I'll say it for you, but pretend like Ruby did. He says, uh, remember who you are. It's the best line in the whole movie, people, come on. He hits him over the head, he tells him to look in the water, and he says, remember who you are. And as Simba looks into the reflection, asking himself who he really is, he sees his father and hears his father voice saying, son, remember who you are. It gives me goosebumps just telling the story. It's only after Simba remembers who he really is, what his true identity and purpose is, that he returns to his rightful place in the kingdom. He returns to take the responsibility he had tried to shirk, to care for the kingdom, to build it up, to act like the son of the king, the beloved, and to do what brings joy and honor to the father. It's a great example for us to look in the water and remember who we are. In a few moments, as we sing our closing hymn, I'm going to invite you to come forward to the baptismal waters so that you can renew and reaffirm your own baptism. As you do so, take time to look into the water, remembering that our baptism wasn't just an act, a ritual that happened a long time ago, but it was the beginning of a lifetime of walking with Christ. May you peer into the water, and as you glimpse your reflection, may the waters reveal to you what has always been there. May you remember who you are, child of the Most High King, beloved, the one with whom God is well pleased. Remember who you are. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.